Um, welcome to the Echo Heard Around the World, sharing information about legal assistance with human trafficking survivors and lawyers. I'm Michelle Stegman. I'll be your moderator for the panel today. I am the administrator for the New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking. The coalition is a fully volunteer run organization that coordinates statewide community efforts to end sex trafficking and labor trafficking in the state of New Jersey. We have about 200 volunteers. We have about 180 affiliate organizations, including academic, law enforcement, and direct service providers. We empower communities with the knowledge of what human trafficking is, how to prevent it, and how to support those affected by it. One of our guiding principles is to be survivor informed, meaning that survivors form a critical portion of our leadership and they inform how we do what we do and what exactly it is that we do. I am also a volunteer with the Volunteer Lawyers for Justice in the state of New Jersey. They are an organization of pro bono attorneys that assist survivors in vacatur and expungement. And on our panel today is Jessica Kitson, their Director of Advocacy, to discuss further um, what that means and how it impacts survivors. I'm going to um, turn the introductions over to the panelists themselves to introduce who they are. Before we get started, I just wanted to take care of one housekeeping uh, item, and that is questions. You will notice that you have a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen or somewhere else within your screen. Um, please feel free to enter your questions as they occur to you. We are fortunate enough to have with us today Kate Lee, the Executive Director of the New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking, and she will be reading and reviewing the questions as we go along and asking them in real time. If, however, a question occurs to you and um, you don't ask it at the moment, no worries, we will have a Q&A session at the conclusion of our panel. And so uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to the first panelist to introduce himself, Mr. Harold D'Souza. Happy morning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michelle. And I would like to appreciate and thank uh, New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking for engaging survivors to live their life with freedom and happiness. My name is uh, Harold D'Souza. I am from India. I am a survivor of labor trafficking and debt bondage in the United States of America. Uh, I have started a nonprofit organization called Eyes Open International focused on prevention, education, protection, and empowerment of victims, survivors, and vulnerable populations uh, worldwide. But today, my passion is to be the voice for the voiceless victims. Thank you very much, and thanks for attending this seminar, and thanks to all the attorneys who have empowered survivors to thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Jessica Kitson. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica Kitson, and I am the Director of Legal Advocacy at Volunteer Lawyers for Justice. As Michelle said, we are a civil legal services organization based in Newark, New Jersey, and we provide um, civil legal aid on a variety of legal issues, including su uh, legal support to survivors of human trafficking. Um, we do a lot of criminal record clearing, which I'm going to talk a lot about um, today, um, some immigration assistance um, and other holistic uh, legal services for trafficking survivors. I'm also a consultant with the Survivor Reentry Project, which is uh, out of Freedom Network USA, and we do training and technical assistance uh, for survivors of human trafficking looking to clear their criminal records. More to come on that. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Jessica. Aldina Havde. Hi everyone, nice to be here. Um, my name is Aldina Havdi and I've been a child advocate for more than 20 years with the last 15 or so focused in the area of pediatrics. Um, I've been working at the national district and state levels of the American Academy of Pediatrics, really managing writing and developing grants and program curricula related to the prevention of adverse childhood experiences, which is very much related to what we're talking about today. I'm a current board member of the coalition, and I also serve on the New Jersey Commission on Human Trafficking, on the New Jersey Child Assault Provide Prevention Advisory Board, and the Prevention Committee of the New Jersey Task Force on Child Abuse and Neglect. Um, I graduated from Western Oregon University with a BA in Psychology, minor in English Lit, and um, earned my master's in social work from Rutgers. 
where I really focused my time on administration policy and planning for, for children and families. Thank you, Aldina. And Gina Cavallo. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm the consultant with the New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking. I serve on the board of trustees and appointed to serve on the New Jersey Commission Against Human Trafficking. I'm also the co-chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics Anti-Trafficking Task Force. I'm the founder of We Rise, uh, Respect, Inspire, Support, and Empower Assisting Survivors um, of Trafficking. Uh, with any resources as well as emergency needs. And glad to be here this morning with you all. Thank you so much, Gina. Okay, so um, to begin and kick off the conversation, um, we're going to start with Harold. Um, so Harold, you, you mentioned in your introduction um, a little bit about, about your background, your experience. Can you um, describe a little bit more in detail um, you know, what it was that you were referring to? Uh, yes, Michelle, and I would like just like to inform all my friends who are watching here, and I know there are some delegates from India. In India, 50 years back and for the next 50 years, there's a proverb that going to America is going to Swarg. Swarg is a vernacular language in India, in Hindi. That means heaven. It means paradise. So with that temptation, or with that uh, dream, I was invited in the year 2003 to the United States of America on an H-1B visa. I came on a work visa on a $75,000 salary per year plus benefits as a business development manager. Friends, please understand, I'm an Asian and we Indians always convert dollars into rupees. So $1 today is something like 82 rupees and 65 cents. But in those days, it was 43 rupees. So it was much of money. And I thought that I will fast forward, fast forward the life for my kids because I had two boys who were four years and seven years old. So I came to the United States of America on four things. I came on a trust. I came on a faith. I came on a promise. And I came to live my American dream. But little did I know, the day I landed in the United States of America, my trafficker said, Harold, are you carrying any cash? And I was carrying $1,000 cash. And he tells me, Harold, this is America. This is US. You can't keep any cash with you. It is not safe. Now, I am from India. I didn't know the culture. I didn't know the people. I didn't know how the law enforcement agency operated in this country. So I gave the $1,000 cash. I gave all my documentation to keep in safe custody. But that's a red flag. And that was the biggest mistake I did in my life. And we were made to work in a restaurant. My wife was not supposed to work. She was on an H4 dependent visa. And he fixed her salary $2,000 a month. And he manipulated, tricked, and trapped us, telling that oh, I'm going to buy you your house, you got two kids. So labor trafficking in the United States of America happens at four places. That's restaurants, gas stations, convenience stores, and motels. And they provide accommodation next door or within the premises. Because after drugs, labor trafficking is the biggest business, like it's $150 billion industry. So I always tell that I'm a common man, I'm a failure, and I'm a sinner. Because a lot of things transpired in my life when I became a victim of labor trafficking and debt bondage in the United States of America, every victim or foreign national who is a victim of labor trafficking has one nickname. I know Gina is on the show here with us today. Every girl in sex trafficking has a different name. But in labor trafficking, there is only one nickname, and that's illegal. So I was never called Harold. My traffickers would snap his fingers like that and tell me, hey, illegal, come here. So what happens in the mind, body, and soul of a victim? He or she thinks that he is a criminal. And that is what happened to me. I came legally, but then over a period of time, I thought that I'm a criminal. He always told us that Americans do not like brown-skinned guys. And I believed him. They use four words, perpetrators in the US, in labor trafficking, to foreign nationals, and even today. Number one. I'll get you arrested. 
Number two, I'll get you handcuffed. And when they say handcuffed, they do by action. Do you want to get handcuffed? Number three, I'll get you jailed. And number four, I'll get you deported. Friends, no human being, no American would like to hear these four words. When you are not a criminal, you are an innocent human being. And you have come here to this country to make a life better for yourself and to your family back in your own country. For any common man to survive in the United States of America, again, you need four things. You need a state ID. You need a work permit. You need a social security card. You need freedom. So my trafficker gave us accommodation next door, which was just had to cross the road. And it was not even 100 meters. And this is how they operate. We used to sleep on the floor, no microwave, no food. And he didn't pay us a penny for 18 months. And I want to just give one example. I'm just going to cut short because this is just the tip of the iceberg. I just want to understand that what happens in the life of a victim of labor trafficking and debt bondage. I'm just a face to it. But there are a lot of victims who are going through this. And that is the reason I want to be the voice for the voiceless victims. In the month of August in 2003, my trafficker tells me that you need, to, you need to take a bank loan. I said, no, I don't need a bank loan. He said, no, I have to build your credit. I didn't know what his credit score because in India, it was all cash transactions. But anyway, he tells me, I got to buy you a house. I had never applied for a bank loan. He takes me to a bank. And in five minutes, I'm in the manager's cabin. I still don't know which that bank was. I get a check in my name, which is a five figures. And yeah. He drives me back to his house and all perpetrators or traffickers are multi-millionaires. Please note this, they are multi-millionaires because the risk factor is very thin. The profit margins are very thick. We have attorneys here on the panel. Out of 10, nine do not get prosecuted. And that is the reason I'm trying to create awareness. He takes me to his house, puts a scotch in a short glass and tells me, Harold, cheers. Let's celebrate, you're a rich man. By the time the scotch could reach my stomach, he removes a cheat from his pocket and he tells me, Harold, you owe me this money. He flipped. And friends, it was not $10,000. It was not $20,000. It was not $40,000. It was much more. And I looked at that figure. In one second, I lost four things. I lost my voice. I lost my courage. I lost my hope. And I lost my freedom. And before I could realize what hit me, he taps me behind on my back and tells me, let's go, let's go. You owe me much more. But see, I didn't know it was a dead bondage. I had no clue. But next day, my trafficker withdrew all the money, cash from my bank account. See, I always tell that in God's home, there is delay, no denial. That same chit which I had with me saved my life. FBI agent, when my case was with the FBI agent in 2007, they matched the handwriting. They went to the bank account. Next day, he had withdrawn all the cash. So that is how I could get justice. So I always tell that all long journeys start with a small step. Trauma has no expiration date. Many times victims and survivors commit suicide. I always say it is not a suicide, it's a murder. Because we as community members need to support I know Jessica is here on the panel who is an attorney and has helped or, or saved a lot of victims' life. So we got to support the victims and survivors. Many times, the behavior of a survivor or victim is negative, but their intentions are positive. Especially for foreign nationals, we cannot communicate. So these are certain things, and it's a long journey. I just like to end on one note or with one example that we from India never saw snow. Right, I didn't. I did not even know how to start a thermostat. We, growing up as a child in my house, there was no running water or electricity. So when we saw snow for the first time, we were so super excited. But we get a note from the school teacher that both my sons cannot come to school if they do not wear snow jackets. They had sweaters from India. Now I didn't know what the hell is a snow jacket, but my chef he bought it. Right. But next day, again, we get a note from the school teacher that both my sons cannot come to school if they do not wear snow gloves. Now, again, they had gloves from India, which was woolen. 
So these are small things which could be a red flag in the community and a person can be rescued and got freedom at a very early stage. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Michelle. I will not take much of the time, but this is my short journey. Like uh, I always tell that I failed on four Ps. I failed as a parent. I failed as a provider. I failed as a person and I failed as a protector. But I turned obstacles into opportunities. I flipped those four Ps into passion, purpose, power, and prayers. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, let's turn back to your discussion about the FBI becoming involved <clears throat> in your situation. Um, so I understand that when you were in Ohio, you ended up at a presentation that involved an attorney. Can you describe a little bit about how you ended up at that presentation and what the presentation was about? I was struggling for a job. I didn't have a status. Uh, and somebody in my parish told me that you should do a course at Cincinnati Works. It's a nonprofit organization helping anyone for a job. And I was doing the program. It is a one week crash course. And I didn't have any status. But there was an attorney who took one class in that uh, workshop. And she said that if you have any felonies, any problems, come to me. <laughs> like speeding tickets or anything. So I went to her. Her name is Jodi Dries Ganot. She is an attorney there. And I was very scared of her. But when she saw all my documentations from the US Department of Labor, wage and division of my wife, she was totally perplexed and shocked that how can this happen in the US? And uh, she is the one who opened the doors for me. She knocked all the doors. She's, she was dialing. And that is how she got me connected with the FBI. Okay, so she was um, giving, a, giving a presentation at Cincinnati Works about actually vacatur and expungement. Right. And how did you even, how did you hear about Cincinnati Works? It was from my parish because I was struggling for a job. See, once my trafficker hired a guy to kill me. See, this is not, a, it's not a joke. It's not something like, it's, it's, it's different. You forget everything. You don't want money. You don't want green card. You don't want freedom. You don't want anything when it's a survival of your life, right? He, he threatened to kidnap my kids. It was a terror. Means I was going through hell. My, my mind was not working. I didn't know what to do. So when I went to this uh, Cincinnati Works, it is still there. I still uh, advocate or I, re I still uh, support them. This is where I met uh, Jodi Dries Gonod and she got me connected with the FBI. And the FBI agent, she is a very nice lady. She had, I think, more than 23 years of experience. And this was the first case she was handling on an H H1B visa. And I had no clue, uh, Michelle, that there was something called continued presence, right? So she understood my case. I didn't know, like when you go to a doctor, you say, I got a stomach pain. And you say, I got a stomach, but the doctor knows that maybe I got cancer or I got appendix, <laughs> right? But I think oh, it's just a stomach pain, I'm okay. But she knew exactly my problem. She knew the pulse of what I was going through. Right. So when she got me the CP, continued present st status to my house, she used to always drive me down with my family. See, uh, these are small things, but very big things. Very big. Yeah, she used to come, take us in her car to her office, do the fingerprinting, whatever she was doing, I didn't know. But she never left us alone, like, because we didn't have transportation. You need transportation, right? She got food to her house, Indian food. So these are, these are some small things that transform me. And I want to tell you one thing that how it changed, like there are attorneys here and how a law enforcement agency can transform the life of a victim or a survivor to thriving. I was not cooperating or telling her everything was I was scared. I was told that I'll get deported, I'll get jailed because my case has gone to the FBI. So I had the psychological fear of the police that I'll get jailed and I'll get deported. So she could see it on my face and body. But this FBI agent, I'll even take her name, Pam Matson. she did my entire research till India and she realized that I am a victim of labor trafficking and debt bondage. She flipped. She came to me always as a mother rather than as an agent. And one day she came to my house where she came to know that my wife was sexually abused through her research or investigation. And then she walked out. And again, she came and knocked the door and she came and told me, Harold, I'm coming here just to help you and to get you a status that is a permanent residency card. She said that. 
I don't care what you do. I know you got to take care of your family. You got to take care of your kids. Even if you're working anywhere, and if you're getting money below under table, I'm not here for that. And Michelle and Jessica, I'll be honest. I used to work in a store where I was getting five dollars per hour under the table, cash. And I thought that if she comes to know, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I feel good. like there, it seems like, especially you know, in the context of people coming to the U.S. that weren't previously in the U.S., that they might not be familiar with, as you said, kind of the traditions and the, the the normalcy, you know, within the U.S. in terms of how it's supposed to work. You know, is an employer supposed to take your documents? Are they supposed to take your cash? Is it okay to have cash? And people just don't, might not know that. And then they come here and and it leaves them more vulnerable to the situation that, that you ended up in. Um, and so part of the, the focus of the panel is the concept that it's wonderful that you found Cincinnati Works and that you were able to then, you know, find an attorney who then kind of put the pieces together and said, wait a minute, this is not how it's supposed to be in the U.S. They're, they're kind of giving you a bunch of misinformation. Um, but not everybody has access to that and and not everybody has the good luck to stumble upon that resource and so that's that's part of what we're trying to dive into a little bit further today is how do we get that word out how do more people find out about cincinnati works or vlj or other entities so i think at this point we'll probably move on to our next speaker and thank you very much harold um, always wonderful to hear you, um, Jessica Kitson, to talk a little bit about vacator expungement um, and what's going on in that arena for survivors. Thanks, Michelle. I'm going to share my screen. You'll let me know if you can see it. How's that? Okay. That is looking good. Great. Thank you. And I, I just um, want to say, Harold, thank you so much. I think that you really laid such a, an incredible groundwork. You could give a master class. You just did, in fact, <laughs> on the dynamics, the many dynamics of what trafficking can look like. Um, and I say can look like because what we all know is that for all survivors, it, it, it can look very, very different. But you hit on so many of the important dynamics that we see. And and really, and, and to the point that I'm going to go into now about why we need criminal record clearing for survivors, it's because so much of trafficking is about that power imbalance, right? It is about someone taking advantage of their knowledge of our systems, our criminal legal systems, our immigration systems, and using those as weapons, really, um, to, to further the, the, um, the power dynamic against the people who are vulnerable um, and being taken advantage of. So thank you so much for sharing um, those stories. And I also wanna say, you know, as I'll get into in a little bit, for so long, we think about criminal record clearing as something that's important for sex trafficking survivors, and it is. Um, but I think your story also tells us about why it is important for all survivors, um, because it, it really um, can impact just about anybody. So thank you um, so much for sharing that. What I'm going to talk about um, is exactly that: is criminal record clearing for survivors of human trafficking, and what that, what the history of how we got to where we are today, um, to get some laws um, and relief available to survivors, and what the next step is um, to make it an actual reality for survivors um, across the country um, and really anywhere in the world um, where survivors are being criminalized. I think very often, and certainly the media narrative portrays trafficking victims as just that, as victims. And so we assume that any interaction they're going to have with the criminal legal system is going to be as a victim, right? Or as a witness to a crime. Um, and what we don't spend enough time thinking about is that very, very often survivors are in fact um, their first and, and for some their only interaction with the criminal legal system is in fact as um as criminals, they are arrested um, for a variety of different charges. Um, and so not only does that mean that they're left with criminal records, um, which I'm gonna get into why that's problematic, but also it means that their interaction with law enforcement has not been the best um, and which can have additional complications for when we do um, want folks to come forward as witnesses um, and cooperate um, in working against the traffickers themselves. And this really is not a new concept. When the United States passed the Trafficking Victims Protection Act in 2000, 
um, it recognized it. And in fact, part of the law specifically states that victims of severe forms of trafficking should not be inappropriately incarcerated, fined, or otherwise penalized for acts that were committed as a result of being trafficked. Um, and so this is an important piece that has been part of US law um, in the United States, trafficking in persons report that comes out every year. Um, this has been an important fact sheet as well um, to recognize that across the board, we want governments um, at the state, at the local, at the national level to recognize that survivors should not be criminalized for conduct that was a result of their trafficking. And here's why, right? Because <laughs> the consequences can be enormous for survivors. And as Harold so clearly pointed out, when a survive, when a, when someone is being trafficked, they're vulnerable to begin with, right? They very often do not have the means to extricate themselves. They are often are not aware of what the laws are that might support them. And so, what we do when we add criminal records to that is we further victimize them and we leave them very vulnerable to additional um, victimization down the road, because arrest convictions. Um, can have an impact on someone's housing. It can impact education. Um, we have had survivors come to us who are forced to register as sex offenders as a result of some of their convictions that are on there. That has kept them not only from getting jobs, it has kept them from moving into certain neighborhoods. We have had heartbreaking clients who were not able to attend events at their children's school as a result of being on these lists. So the consequences can be pretty severe. For, for our national clients, it, the consequences actually impact their ability um, to access the immigration laws that were designed to protect survivors of trafficking. And so with this background, we really want to think about how um, we have come forward to address the issue and what we want to do next. So this is what the United States map looked like in 2009. <laughs> um, I guess I could have started with 2008 and the whole, <laughs> the whole map would have been gray. But in 2009, there was New York all by its lonesome. Um, and it passed the first uh, criminal record clearing law in the country that um, allowed survivors, some survivors to clear some offenses from their record. This was a really watershed moment for the United States because soon after this happened in 2009, most states in the country began to develop laws. And in fact, this is what our map looks like today, which is a real testament to advocates and survivors who have been working across the country to make sure that this um, really became a reality. What I will say too is that um, in, in 2019, by 2019, we had 43 states that had some form of relief for survivors on the books, which is great. We have even more than that today. Um, and this, what we've seen is that it's really been in waves. So we've had um, laws passed. They, some of them were limited. I think the second wave states, states that came later, learned from the mistakes um, of those early adopters. Um, and so we've had a wave of additional laws come in so that we now have significantly stronger laws in um, a majority of the states. And what this relief does, right? It has real meaningful impact for survivors. It, first and foremost, it remedies a past injustice. It takes that person who was originally treated as a criminal, right? Because that, that's what we were doing. We were saying, you were a criminal, you were bad, you did something wrong. And it's recognizing, in fact, that they were a victim um, at the time. And so it's taking that away and remedying how we originally mistreated them. Um, but it also, what I love about this process is that it is survivor controlled and that a survivor decides when they are ready to come forward, when they want to take this step, when they want to seek assistance. It can be very empowering for them, as I said, when survivors have had very limited interaction with the court system, um, except for their arrests and convictions, it can be very, very empowering to now come back and say, no, I'm in control now and I'm gonna show who I really am and who I was um, and how I should be treated. And then of course it has a tremendous impact on all of the stakeholders who are upholding that system, right? So judges, prosecutor, court personnel, to understand what trafficking looks like, to understand that it is a, a multitude of dynamics, um, and to understand that people who are coming before them to this day and being sent through the system um, for various 
um, offenses may in fact be survivors because the hope is not to just get everybody going through the system and then eventually clearing their record. Our long-term goal is to recognize survivors from the outset so that they don't have these convictions um, in, the, in the first place. And don't take it from me. Um, here are some pretty powerful words uh, from a survivor who talked about what the impact is and the impact on both sides of it, right? Um, and so it's what happens when you apply for jobs, um, the fear of applying for jobs. We have had survivors come and say, I'm not applying for anything because I know exactly what's going to happen when they pull my record. Um, and, and the results, just to be clear, is not only that a survivor does not get the job. That's, that's problematic, right? Not getting the job is problematic. We've had survivors talk about being incredibly harassed by supervisors once that background um, search had been done um, and they saw prostitution um, and related offenses on their record. So th the consequences are, are pretty dire, not just in terms of not getting the job, but not even putting yourself out there, not going for education. I've had numerous clients who wanted to be social workers and couldn't get into social work school because they didn't. the schools didn't believe that they would be eligible um, to be admitted to the professional um, licensing once they were all done. So uh, it's a real ripple effect of consequences. And once it's done, the, this quote says it perfectly, the doors open again. And that's really what we want, right? We want our survivors to be able to have those doors open and to be able to move forward and, and rebuild um, after what's happened to them. Now, what do the laws look like? It varies. And so if anyone is in a place where you're thinking about bringing these laws to your jurisdiction, you wanna improve your laws, you want to think about what it looks like. Um, so in the United States, the process relief varies from greatly, greatly from state to state. But really the elements are trafficking. Who is eligible for this relief, right? So it's going to be related to trafficking, but is it going to be related to all trafficking survivors? So for example, New York, New Jersey, again, these early adopter states crafted laws that made it largely impossible that anyone but sex trafficking survivors would be eligible for that relief. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail now, but minors is another consideration as well. How do these laws impact minors and the, the um, arrests and records that they may have um, as part of their juvenile record um, for trafficking that occurred? What offenses are eligible is a big piece of that. I'm going to get into that a little bit more in the next coming slides. The nexus um, of the trafficking to the arrest and con uh, conviction, right? So are we saying that the person had to be being trafficked at that exact moment, or are we saying that the trafficking is what resulted in that arrest and conviction? It sounds like a minor detail, but it's something you want to think about as you're trying to think about bringing these um, laws to your jurisdiction, because the nuance there can be pretty important. Confidentiality. It seems so obvious, <laughs> but I can tell you that many states have laws where the filing for criminal record relief ends up being public. And then what's the point really, right? So, okay, we don't have it on our record, but anyone can go down to the courthouse and get access to these filings. Um, or the person has to put their name on all of them rather than use an alias. So you want to think about how we're protecting the survivor's confidentiality throughout the entire process. And then consolidation. We're always looking for ways to ensure that a survivor does not have to file more petitions than is necessary. So in the United States, this is a very state-specific process. That's always going to be the case but maybe we don't make the person file eight different petitions in the state of California, for example, right? Let's see how we can consolidate. So those are the basic elements when we're talking about criminal record relief, what we're looking at. Um, and then you wanna think about what impacts, right? We're gonna see, is it just the arrest record? Um, are those open anyway? Is it gonna be access to court documents? How can we actually get to the, the, the true gold standard, right? is vacating and reversing convictions. We want an undoing of any convictions that actually happened. And as you see here, there, the types of offenses is uh, various across lots of different states. And here's why that's important, because look at this chart, right? So yes, a lot of survivors identify as being arrested for prostitution, but look at all of these other, right? We have drug offenses, we have theft and larceny, trespass, forgery, and false documents. Um, I will say false documents is a tremendously um, common offense for labor trafficking survivors um, to come forward with, that they will have convictions for 
assault and battery, robbery, and then the all encompassing other. Um, but so if we're going to have survivors telling us that they are going to, um, that they have been held responsible for all of these different types of charges, it's crucial then that our laws recognize that and actually come forward and do that. And as I said earlier, the second wave of laws that have been coming through in more recent years, um, I'd say probably in the last five or six years, are definitely showing an awareness of that and being much more all-encompassing um, with that. This is just an example of New Jersey, <laughs> um, thanks in large part to the efforts of the New Jersey Coalition Against Trafficking um, and, and a series of stakeholders. We were able to amend New Jersey's law just last year to ensure that it um, offered much more wide um, relief on a variety of charges. Um, we have five, there's only five now in New Jersey for which someone cannot seek vacature. My professional opinion is that we should not even have a carve out for those five, um, but well, you know, baby steps and we'll get there. But I, this is an, a very important development for survivors seeking relief in New Jersey and a real example of, of how we got here and, and what the, the landscape is looking like. So we have these laws, we've had this incredible, right? If you think back to that map that I showed you of 2009 versus now, we've had tremendous success in getting these laws on the books. Hooray, our job is done, nothing more to do, right? I wish, <laughs> now we need to use those laws. The laws are only good if they're being taken advantage of, right? Saying that we offer this relief to survivors means nothing if survivors are not aware of the relief and don't know how to access the relief. And those two things are important and they are separate, right? Even if we get the word out to survivors, that's only step one. So why is this so important? Well, I'll tell you. Because in 2016, the National Survivor Network said 91% of trafficking survivors who responded to the survey had reported having been arrested at some point, right? Over 50% report that every single arrest on their record is trafficking related. 42% were arrested as minors, over 40% uh, reported being arrested over nine times or more, and 60% report being arrested for crimes other than prostitution, right? So this tells us that there are a lot of people out there who have criminal records as a direct result of being trafficked. And I, right, as with all things related to trafficking, statistics remain very elusive. There's a lot of reasons for that that we're not gonna go into today. But I can tell you from anecdotal experience um, in New Jersey, from what I'm seeing through the survivor reentry project at the national level, that we are barely scratching the surface in reaching all of these survivors and making sure that they are aware that they can access um, criminal records. And so outreach is needed, right? We need to get the word out. Who do we need to get the word out to? I'm always going to start with survivors themselves, like through their own networks. Gina is a perfect example of a survivor who is always looking to spread the word to other survivors, who's always thinking, I mean, Jessica, <laughs> I have someone, can I, I'm going to send you an email, right? I think that is the most powerful way that we can get the word. It is word of mouth among survivors because it builds trust. Um, it, it allows them to explain what the process is much more than me coming and saying, you don't know me, but let me tell you about this relief that we can do. Again, because there's a distrust, there's a rightful distrust of the legal system. And so if we can use survivor networks themselves to get the word out, I think that's going to be our most powerful force. But that's not all. We can't stop there. Public defenders are a really obvious group that we should be connecting with. They very often are the people that were standing next to the survivor um, when the arresting convictions happened, right? And I don't say that critically. I don't mean that they, they did something wrong. Survivors are rarely able um, and feel safe to identify as survivors at the time of the arrests and convictions. Um, but the, the public defenders very often are gonna know who had um, a lot of these arrests. They're gonna be in touch potentially and they're a very important resource for us. Social service agencies, for sure, the social workers that are um, working sur with survivors on a daily basis. Immigration attorneys, right? So very often we have people who know a lot about immigration, even know a lot about how immigration has impacted 
um, by trafficking and what those options are. But if you don't know that there's a way to clear those records, right? Um, and I think especially for a lot of private attorneys, we aren't getting the word out enough um, on, on the relief that's available. And then finally, medical professionals. Again, I think, you know, Harold really told a story about lots of different people, the story of the school, right? The, the teachers at the school and, and red flags and things that we could be aware of. I think if we're getting the laws and the relief that are available out to the right people, we will see a cascading effect. There's a lot of um, hand wringing sometimes when we try and pass these laws about the floodgates are gonna open. If we allow this relief, the floodgates are gonna open. Everyone's gonna say I'm a trafficking survivor. And I'm just sitting here praying for these floodgates to open. <laughs> like let's, let's see some floodgates. Let's get to the point where we do it. And of course, I do mean that. And yet my last point on this slide, right? We need to be able to meet the need. We have to be prepared to not just get the word out, but then there's a lot of work to do to make sure that when survivors come forward, we have the attorneys ready to file those petitions. The court system can handle it. The prosecutors are ready to work hand in hand with us. And so there's a lot of work that needs to happen. Um, some other challenges that I'm just gonna point out quickly and resources all combined into one. Freedom Network USA has a survivor reentry project that provides training and technical assistance on this issue across, um, across the board. And so um, for anyone who is looking for relief, especially survivors who have arrests in multiple jurisdictions, which is very, very common, Survivor Reentry Project can be a great place to start. Um, they have training and technical assistance for survivors to contact them directly. But then also, if you are a professional assisting survivors, you can reach out independently to get more information and to get the ball rolling on behalf of a client. Um, and then the last thing I will say is we do not have federal vacature relief in this country right now. Um, and that's something that I would be remiss to not point out because we do have countless survivors who have federal charges, federal convictions as a result of being trafficked. And if we can't get those off their record, then all the state relief in the world is not going to help them. Um, Senator Gillibrand proposed um, legislation several years ago. It hasn't really moved, but that is that is one piece um, that is missing in this in this puzzle. Is that it is it is a big chunk of what's missing in terms of um, this country's response to to criminal record relief for survivors. And so, with that, I don't know if people had um, any questions. I'm happy to take any, but I can also go on mute and we can talk later. <laughs> um, I believe that Kate Lee has been reviewing the Q&A and um, no questions currently sitting outstanding for you, Jessica. Um, but I wanted to have some a little bit of chat um, relating to your presentation. <clears throat> and thank you so much for doing it. Very informative. Um, so we, we use terms like vacatur, expungement. Um, can you put a little bit of a definition to those two terms and explain the difference? I'm sorry, between vacatur and expungement? Yes. Yep. So that's a great question. So expungement is really, and again, every jurisdiction is going to have a different definition of what this means. But traditionally, we think of expungement as the sealing of records, kind of the hiding of records. The records exist, but we are hiding them. And that exists in, in most states um, in the country. And it is a, it's really a remedial relief that's available. So the idea is that after a certain period or under the right circumstances, we don't want someone's criminal record to be a barrier to them. And so we're going to help them hide it so that they don't have to report it so they're able to move forward. And that's great relief. It's super important. I think we should have more <laughs> expungement, all good. But it's separate from what we're talking about here, because what we're talking about here with vacature and with criminal record relief, because not every state says vacature, um, but it's the undoing of the conviction, right? And so that's an important piece of it. It's not just hiding it. It's saying this conviction should never have happened. Um, and again, I want to be clear. It's not saying that people made mistakes, that there was malicious intent to do the wrong thing. It's saying that if we knew then what we know now, this would not have resulted in a conviction. And we don't, we want to remedy that past injustice. And so it's very different. Now, in states like New Jersey, you'll very often hear the two used together, vacature and expungement. And that's that's really just a technicality that at the end of the day, we can undo something. But if we want it actually hidden, <laughs> the fact that it ever happened, we also have to expunge. But the vacature is really important. And again, um, for many um, survivors who have immigration consequences um, that they are dealing with, it's very important to distinguish between those two. 
um, because there is a big difference in terms of how, um, from an immigration standpoint, we're going to view convictions that were expunged versus convictions that were undone. And so it's the undoing that's super important. Got it. Thank you. Can you uh, describe a little bit for the audience what bench warrants are and how they figure into this? Sure. So what we find um, in New Jersey and, and I know elsewhere is that many survivors, and, and I think this is an important point too, and it gets to what you um, and Harold spoke about in terms of having a lawyer who kind of knows, hey, you're entitled to this relief. Um, we very often have survivors come to us who are shocked to find that they have a, a criminal record. And, and it can happen in a couple of ways, but some is because they have an open warrant against them. They had no idea, right? They thought it was behind them. The first um, survivor in New Jersey to get re record relief participated um, as a cooperating witness in a federal investigation and pros uh, prosecution um, against her traffickers and was promised in writing <laughs> that her records would be taken care of um, as a thanks for cooperating. And it never happened. But she went about her life believing that her record had been had been cleared. Um, and so warrants are especially tricky because we don't want people wandering around not knowing that they have open warrants against them. Um, and so usually a bench warrant is something that can happen when it's a failure to appear, um, didn't check in with probation if it was passed a judgment or there was an open charge um, and never appeared um, in municipal court for the you know, for the court proceedings. So um, one thing that we work um, at Volunteer Lawyers for Justice, we work with survivors. Michelle is really our, <laughs> our, our rock star volunteer on this front um, to work with the prosecutors, to work with the court and encourage them um, certainly to remove the warrant at a minimum. Um, but our goal really is to get those charges dismissed whenever possible. Yes, for sure. And one of the things I know that, that my clients are very concerned about is that um, unlike a conviction, and a conviction is horrible and needs to be removed, obviously, but with a bench warrant, if that's identified, let's say you're crossing state lines to go visit family and you're pulled over by the police and they notice you have a bench warrant, you could be arrested immediately and brought into jail. Um, and that is very, very obviously troubling to anybody that's encountering that. So, right. I think, right. You had a client who couldn't go to visit, I think it was a grandchild or, right, somebody that they wanted desperately to, but. We're very afraid of coming into the state. Um, and again, I, this gets to the piece about why education is so important. Education to reach survivors, but also education to reach other stakeholders so that when survivors are coming forward in those moments, that we have people with an understanding of what was going on, why there was a failure to appear, and how we can remedy it as quickly as possible and with as little damage as possible. Because every interaction is an opportunity for re-traumatization, re-victimization. And so we really want to be careful to avoid that whenever we can. Absolutely. Um, one element that may um, hold people back from pursuing getting in touch with an attorney um, is a concern about cost. But the reality is that organizations like VLJ and others throughout the country actually offer these services free of charge to certain people, depending on income level, et cetera. Um, so have you ever seen a situation where um, people did not, a, a survivor, let's say, was not aware of that and then ended up having to spend substantial amounts of money dealing with an attorney who also was unaware, probably, that there was even free assistance available? Yeah, I think that's a big concern because very often you're not going to have a lot of private attorneys aware of this relief, aware how to bring it. Um, I I hope that we're getting the word out enough that the uh, legal assistance comes free of charge. Um, most states um, have that. That's why the survivor reentry um, project is so important because they're connecting for pro bono legal services. Um, but another piece of that too is making sure that there are no court costs associated with filing these petitions and that we're not making really burdensome fees um, that have to go along with it. Back to your question about open bench warrants, very often, it's there's a fine associated um, with those open charges. And the idea is like, okay, we'll just come, you know, come down to the courthouse and pay that $700 and the, the bench warrant will go away as if people are just sitting around waiting to, to pay $700. And so I think that's an important point because cost really can be uh, a barrier to access here. Um, I am very pleased to say that most states really do have free legal assistance available to survivors who need it. That's fantastic. 
So to go back to the core and kind of central um, theme of, of the panel in terms of getting the word out. So you had mentioned in your slides that there are various uh, touch points with different um, systems and different providers that so survivors come in contact with. It could be social services. It could be, you know, a medical provider um, that seems to create a kind of a significant challenge in getting that word out because how do you find a modicum that's going to touch on all of these different you know industries and providers that really often don't intersect with each other or interact with each other on an ongoing basis so they might not be aware um, that this relief is available they might not be aware of how to get people in touch with the right people to to deal with it um any thoughts on on that and how you can you know, for example, let's say turning to the to a kind of a the instance of say child abuse. If a medical provider sees evidence of that, or a teacher in a school sees evidence of that, they have actually a legal responsibility to report that. And no such thing exists, unfortunately, for survivors that might have been subjected to human trafficking. So, any thoughts, just off, you know, from your perspective of how we can, you know, kind of blend those and connect those individuals and, and those entities? Yeah, I I don't know that I have the answer on sort of the how to get there, but I think that the key is going to be around the idea of when you have someone in front of you who ha identifies as having a criminal record, right? So I think that's got to be the linchpin of the, of the education, of the outreach, is that if somebody says, I have a record, right, that we say, dig a little bit deeper, right? Get a little bit more information. Has that been part of the victimization? Is it connected to that? Because I think that's where, again, to what Harold was talking about earlier, so often that's weaponized, right? The very fact of a weapon is weaponized against survivors. And so they're afraid to tell people. And when they do, if they have someone who doesn't know what to do with that information, then what's the point, right? And so if we get to the point where people who are likely to be interacting with survivors understand what to do when they hear about a record, okay, there's somebody who might be able to help. And again, to the point about expungement as well, even if a survivor may not be eligible to clear all or part of their record under the state's um, vacature laws, right? The specific for survivors, because we have expungement laws as well, there's so many reasons to look and see what can be done there. But I think part of it has to be taking the sting out of how traffickers weaponize the, the very fact of a criminal record. I've had so many survivors tell me that their traffickers said to them, like, you've got a record now. What are you going to do? Right. Like your family finds out that you have that um, or right to Harold's point, like there's shame that comes along with it. And you're now you're convinced that you are a criminal. Right. That's the narrative that's been told to you and that you then absorb. And I think our job is to get the word out to, to take that piece of it away. Well, it's all about education and keeping the dialogue and the communication flowing. And to the extent that we can use technology to do that, even better, um, touching on that UN uh, theme for the for this session in general. Um, thank you so much, Jessica. And on that note, and segueing to the next presenter, let's go to Aldina Hopti. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yes, you're looking good. Okay, excellent. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the Project ECHO model, which stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. Um, it's important to know that I'm not an employee of the ECHO Institute. I'm, I'm not promoting this in, in any way um, on, behalf, on their behalf. Um, I'm just a person who really thinks that this model is exceptional and it can be used for, you know, a number of different purposes. So the mission of this model is to what they call democratize medical knowledge and get best practice care to underserved people all over the world. And really, they have an ultimate goal um, at the ECHO Institute to touch the lives of 1 billion people by 2025, which is quite a lofty goal. Um, but before we get started, I did wanna share a brief video of Dr. Aurora who created the model. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And please let me know if you do not hear. Um, 
the sound. Is it good? Sound no, good? No sound, no. No sound. Okay. Sorry about that. Let me reshare with the sound this time. You're good. You're good. There is a specialist shortage worldwide. We had to innovate a new model. Project ECHO allows specialists like me to force multiply expertise. I think that's why it works, because it's very simple. And that's actually why I could come up with an idea like this, because it was simple. In 2003, there were 30,000 patients with hepatitis C in New Mexico. I didn't have enough time to see everybody. And that led to a lot of soul searching. What is the way that I can have a bigger impact than the patients whom I just see in my own clinic. Well, the 1025 was 10 it just came as an idea. Skype was available and talked to my daughters on it. Seeing this technological revolution unfold was probably a background knowledge that I needed to come up with this idea. In 2010 alone, we have trained more than 1,000 healthcare clinicians on our video conferencing platforms. Nurses, primary care doctors, physician assistants. Uniformly, Every single ECHO project that we've started, the specialists find it extraordinarily rewarding sharing their expertise to improve the health of underserved populations in the United States and ultimately all over the world. So building on that video and what Dr. Aurora shared, there are four basic principles of the ECHO model. Um, the first is using technology to really leverage what are often scarce resources and the lack of information and knowledge. And in our case, we use the Zoom technology, which is provided free of charge by the ECHO Institute. The second principle of the ECHO model is to really share best practices on a variety of different topics to really help reduce disparities in access to information and, and ultimately care for people. And the third principle is to use case-based learning to really master complex topics and areas of study. So thinking about some of the things that we've been um, talking about today, um, this is one of the things that we can start talking to about, you know, with one another. Um, the fourth principle of the model is to really monitor these outcomes of what the model is doing using a database that the ECHO Institute actually supplies for you. This ultimately has allowed the ECHO Institute to track the reach of the model across the world, and we'll kind of share that in just a moment as well. So when people hear about the ECHO model, they often confuse it with telemedicine or even e-consults. The model was designed for the medical field, so we're going to talk about that here. And then we'll talk about how it's been adapted to other fields later. So the model is quite different from telemedicine and e-consults. With e-consults, a physician might seek advice from a specialist within a particular area of medicine, for example. With telemedicine, providers either meet with patients directly via an electronic platform, and sometimes they also might confer with specialists about their patients as well. But with the ECHO model, it's really considered more telementoring. There is a group of experts in a specified field of study who work with people who want to learn about that area, who will call the learners, the people who want to learn about that area. And then ultimately, it's, it's affecting the outcomes of those with whom those learners are working. And I'm saying this in, in this way because I want to make it really clear that while this model started out in medicine, and I'll keep reiterating this, it is being used um, all over the world in a number of different venues as well. So again, ECHO stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. And again, it's really a telementary model designed to create these, what we like to call communities of learners, 
by bringing together experts in a particular topic, including the using use of didactic and case-based presentations leading to what the Institute likes to call an all teach, all learn approach. And really this kind of came about because in medicine, um, you have what's called grand rounds. So for those of you who are in medicine, you know what that is. For those of you who aren't, um, it's really where the students, those learners are coming to experts, their teachers um, to, to bring a case, to bring like, I'm having, I had this particular um, person come into the office or come into the hospital and this is what the situation was. And those experts are giving them advice about what to do next. And that's really kind of what the model is based on is, is that um, kind of case-based learning and case-based discussion. So since the model began, um, it's been used again in multiple disciplines and it's really empowered global changes in the fields of health, education, and civics. One example of how this model is helping in other institutions outside of healthcare is with the Albuquerque Police Department. They're actually using the model to redefine how officers learn about crisis intervention. And they were the first law enforcement agency in the country to provide this type of continuing education. Again, that is just one example of a, a, a lot of different programs out there that are now using it beyond the field of medicine. So the ECHO model also addresses the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number four of quality education. It supports inclusive and equitable quality education and really helps to promote lifelong learning opportunities for people all over the world. The model has worldwide reach. There have been over 4 million participants of the model in almost 12,000 cities from 193 countries. Um, there's currently 917 hubs of which the coalition, the New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking is one. And current data shows that over 62 countries have hubs in their countries. And you can see from this graphic, which is the latest one I pulled off, it changes every single day. The latest one I pulled off this morning, you can see that it's been on a steady increase since it started with, of course, the most active years since the pandemic because obviously the need for this type of education has really increased since the pandemic started. In 2020, the coalition became an ECHO hub in New Jersey, one of five that exists in our state. There were five members of our board of trustees that participated in a two and a half day immersion training with the University of New Mexico um, to prepare and deliver this model, really with a goal of ensuring that the fidelity of the model is held to the highest standards. We are prepared to use the model to deliver the education to those who need it, including survivors and lawyers who need access to information and all the other disciplines that we were, that Jessica was just talking about as well today. So when doing research for this presentation, I found an echo that Arizona State University was doing on this topic and it's no longer active, but I did meet with their staff and I wanted to share it with you as an example of what's being done in this space and what could, you know, is a possibility. The aim of their ECHO was to, as you can see, equip medical providers with awareness, tools, and confidence to screen, identify, and connect patients um, affected by human trafficking to, to resources. And the participants of this program were healthcare providers and first responders. The program ran for two years on a weekly basis. There were about 60 sessions in total. It's normally not weekly, by the way. It's normally like a monthly or bi-monthly or quarterly um, but it really can be whatever the need is for that particular topic. And it might start out on a, a weekly basis and it might move to more of a monthly or, or a bi-monthly later on. Um, there, the rules are really, um, you can stretch your imagination. The rules are based on what the need is of your particular um, program or project. So there were a variety of different topics discussed, as you can see, both clinical and non-clinical including um, what I found interesting was the intersection of medical care and the legal system. I'm happy to provide more information and contact information for anyone who's, who's interested in learning a little bit more. So in summary, there are a lot of benefits of this model and, and that's really kind of the focus today is talking about how can we use this technology in what we're discussing today. It works because people who use it wanna help and give up their time. It works because it connects people who have similar interests 
and it provides this access to experts in specialty fields or access to information. You know, it also works because there's increased communication across disciplines. So when Jessica was talking earlier about, you know, it, you know, healthcare providers need to know, lawyers need to know, survivors need, all these different folks need to know it's not just one group. This is, this model is beautiful in that way in that it can reach all of those different groups um, across the world to really be able to, to get that information to those who need it. Um, it has the ability to move the aid needle in areas of high importance, just like what we're talking about today. And again, it provides that immediate access to critical information to those who really do need it the most. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Aldina. Um, so could you describe briefly for us what exactly a hub is? Sure, sure. So it's it's funny. There's there's hubs, there's super hubs. Um, so the Echo Institute basically provides um, a training. So a certain number of people from an organization has to go through what is now used to be called an immersion training and is now called a partner launch training um, to really get people who are interested in running these sorts of programs and running this model, um, make sure that they have all the technology and they have all of the information needed to run it to fidelity, which essentially is, um, is in New Jersey, we have, I believe it's five, there might be more now, but we have five total hubs of which the coalition is one. Um, the organization that I work for in my day job is another. Um, and I think there are there are a couple others in the state that are run by healthcare institutions, but it's not really limited to healthcare institutions. So the hubs are really just those who are able to provide the model um, to provide use that model to provide education to those in their particular fields. Um, a super hub um, is uh, are those folks like the Echo Institute, um, the National American Academy of Pediatrics is a super hub, and I believe there are a couple other super hubs as well that are able to allow uh, provide training to make other people hubs in in their respective areas. So it's really just that the the word hub is just used to to kind of describe that that body of people who are able to provide that education and use that model for that purpose. Got it. Um, you indicated that in the Arizona State program that went on for two years, that they they were looking at the intersection between law enforcement and medical providers. How did they gather those two kind of disparate fields together in one, um, you know, one medium? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the exact answer to that. Um, I did have a conversation with them, just kind of how how they were able to run this. Um, like everything, there's, you know, sometimes limited funding. And so they had funding for a certain set amount of time that they were able to run the program. Um, it, I, I will say, though, the, the program really doesn't cost anything. The Echo Institute does provide everything that you need. It's more the administrative stuff on the back end to be able to make sure that you're holding the model to its fidelity um, and that you are able to um, track the information needed on the side of the ECHO Institute so that they can be able to keep up with that map that you saw of the reach, right? Like their goal really is to reach um, a certain 2 billion lives by 2025. So it's it's a lofty goal. Um, and that really is um, kind of what they're looking at. But that was just one example. The, the intersection between healthcare and law enforcement was just one example of one of the topics that they're, they were utilizing. Excellent. I see we don't have any questions currently in the Q&A. So with that, we will move on to our final speaker, Gina Cavallo. Thank you, Aldina. Um, hello, Gina. Hi. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about your experience with um, vacator and expungement? Um, I would love to. I, um, I didn't really have any experience, nor did I honestly have knowledge of vacature expungement um, until I ran into my own personal experience. And it was early, early on when I came up on board with the coalition. 
And it was then that I had an experience with, um, it was, I wanted to go back to school and um, I decided to go back to school, something that I didn't complete or pursue in my younger years because of a lot of layers I was carrying and a lot of challenges as well as learning disabilities and so much more. So um, I went to school and it was, there was a lot of requirements in order to be accepted because I primarily would be um, educating myself and working with kids. So I could understand why there was like so many rigid requirements. One of the requirements I had was, um, it was doing a background check. And um, in doing the background check, I had to go to the, I believe it was, um, I, be, I think it was the State County Jail or somewhere, and I had to do my fingerprints and all. And I was already in school for a couple of months, and it was that time my, um, I was already, I already started school. They allowed me to start. My references came back. However, when my background check came back, someone from the office inadvertently filed the report and the person that should have seen the report never saw it until after the fact. So that's why there was so much time that went, that went by. With that being said, um, my first experience is when I was getting ready for school one day and I received a call from the director and told me that I couldn't come back. And um, they told me that they re received the results of my um, FBI report and there, was, there were convictions on it, which was, which was the very first time I was aware I was literally traumatized. I was shocked to even hear that. Um, I could remember so clear that phone call it was so surreal and frightening. And I had no idea what to do with it. And um, I was aware that I had arrest from decades ago. Um, I was also skeptical and also suspicious as, as far as the fact that there were doors that um, closed in my past, not really certain why, and I really didn't want to go down that avenue, that, that alley to find out why and where it was coming from because I had my suspicions. But being arrested, um, also one of my arrests, and this was in different municipalities, one of my arrests um, happened where I, as Harold had mentioned earlier about given different identities, I too, when my documents were taken um, from my traffickers, not knowing, even being able to identify with the word trafficking, traffickers at the time, that word was so foreign and displaced from me. Um, all I was convinced was there, anything that happened to me was my fault and I had it coming to me. So, but I do remember um, given a new name, and that's something you never tell the police. But I remember this one arrest, I did tell the police that I was being held against my, um, against my wishes, and that I was also taken advantage by a law enforcement officer in jail. And I was also ultimately, after I reported him to his upper officer, he released me back to my trafficker, which at that time, my one trafficker was a woman. Um, so, but my point is being arrested for me at the time, my interpretation of that, I was never, I never went before a judge. I, I never had any recollection of being convicted, um, of having a trial, of having a jury. So not having much knowledge and understanding on how the law worked um, it was pretty confusing, but it was still a big concern for me. But with the school, they told me, um, I said there had to be a big mistake and I wanted my records. That was one of the things they wouldn't give it to me. They told me I had to redo my prints, um, which was again, 
really like upsetting and um, having to go through that again. I did tell them I was going to come back and they told me I wasn't. They told me I wasn't going to come back, um, even if I cleared this up because I lied on my application. And they said I lied on my application where it said, do you have any convictions of your past? And I said, no, because how am I supposed to know I have convictions of my past if I was unaware of having any convictions of my past? But as far as they were concerned, I was done. I, it didn't matter what I brought back. They weren't going to allow me to come back in school. So with that, I, I was devastated because I said to my husband that day, he said, good luck in school and talk to you later. And um, I remember that day into the evening distinctly. And I was just spiraling quickly downhill. And it was just layer upon layer of the shame, of the fear, um, of not feeling safe. Where do I go with this? And then um, what I went and did is I went to do the prints over again. And um, I was devastated to see, to actually see these rap sheets and um, even the name that I had blocked off that, um, that these criminals gave me in the past um, was sitting there and I was staring right at it. It was, it was pretty devastating. And um, so I didn't know where to go with it. And I don't know why, but um, I wasn't in a good place and two days had passed and I just felt compelled to reach out to the coalition and someone who I felt safe with, which is Kate Lee. And, and I decided to tell her, um, which was a huge, huge step. I mean, for, uh, for a survivor, um, whether they're still in the life or not, to go and tell somebody that, you know, what's going on, because this is not something I dreamt of growing up. This is not something I wanted to happen. This is not a life that I chose. And, but who is gonna believe you? But I did wanna talk to Kate to tell her that I, even though it was the beginning of my time serving on the coalition that I needed to step away because of X, Y, and Z. And I did have, um, was able to muster up the courage to tell her why I needed to move on. And um, I'll never forget her response was just, oh, well, well, this is not a problem. And she minimized the, she minimized not what was going on with me, but she minimized as far as she, she came out with a solution like it was nothing. And she says, um, the, the, well, I'm gonna introduce you to Jessica Kitson from Volunteers Lawyers for Justice. And I have to tell you, um, it was at that point, it, my whole life changed, literally. Um, I found my truth. I found my identity. I found my freedom. I found my inside, my respect. I remember um, having an appointment with Volunteers for Lawyers for Justice. And I'm thinking of the financial end of it this is burdensome, like, how am I going to do this? I'm thinking of so many other things. And just the whole process was overwhelming, because I was just, I was just getting caught up with my thoughts, what if, what it, you know, all these other things. And I remember going to this appointment. And I can't remember the last time I was treated with such dignity and respect. And I remember so clearly that Jessica just treated me with the utmost respect, but she got to work immediately, like immediately. She just started taking information upon information and she put everything in the works like right away. And I couldn't believe it. And even still looking back, um, all the work that they put into my case, because there was more than one, 
And by the time it hit the other attorneys in the other states that do volunteer lawyers for justice as well, that they, they collaborate and work together. I mean, volunteer lawyers for Jessica. Jessica Kitson already had the bulk of the work done, um, which made, which I'm not saying it made it easy for the other attorneys, but it certainly, she did the bulk of the work. But it was, um, it was just the, the whole journey of it. It took um, several years um, before I was able to get the relief I needed from the one state. The, the other state is still pending. But I, I cannot tell you um, how it restored my faith, my dignity, my um, feeling safe in how the justice system works. And for the justice system that failed me, that violated me, that was a thing of the past because I believe there's good and bad with everything and everybody. Um, but volunteer lawyers for justice, I mean, I, I was able to, did, I didn't go back to school. Um, I'm doing what I'm doing today. I, I love being the voice for the voiceless. I love going into my community groups, uh, the survivor community groups, and very frequently I see posts about um, people like myself, guys or girls, through labor trafficking or sex trafficking that are struggling with what I struggled with, and they're looking for resources, and I'm like, I just can't shout out enough for volunteers, lawyers for justice. Um, can we do better? I think there's so many other ways. Yes, we need to be able to um, bring this out more into the light through technology. The ecosystem, I think, is wonderful and could be a huge, huge advantage because like myself, you know, before we can get to a place of, for me, here it is decades later, I didn't even know I had these records hanging over my head. Um, but before we can get to that place, because part of it had to do with me too, because I was burying so much. I think I consumed most of my life trying to hide my trauma, my, my fear, my shame, because I was convinced not only through my family, but I was convinced through these, um, through these criminals that everything that happened to me is what my lot was in life, what I deserved, what I had coming. So to rewire yourself, to go through counseling, to go through that healing journey, which I continue to be on, it's, it's, a, life, it's a life sentence. So to take that component out of your records, which becomes your life sentence, you know, don't forget most of us, we're unable to prosecute those who violated us. And the reason why the reason why we're unable to prosecute these people is because most of them aren't even who they say they are. You know, we talk about we know these people, we know these predators that are violating us, that are forcing us to do things against our will. But you know what? At the end of the day, you try prosecuting them, you're lucky if you find them because they are not who they say they are, because they are masterminded. And, um, and we are afraid, you know, we are afraid of the threats because their threats are real. So to be able to have, I got my freedom, where I got my full freedom was because of the New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking, because of their resources that was provided to me by Kate at, the, at her fingertips and brought me to volunteers to, um, for Lawyers for Justice to Jessica Kitson. That is where I found my freedom. This gives me and to be able to have my voice, not only for myself, but to speak for others, to encourage others, to lift others, and to give others hope that there are people out there like the coalition, like Volunteers Lawyers for Justice, like so many of you that are doing countless work um, and that there is hope and that there are resources. So this is, um, 
This is something that drives me to do what I do. Well, thank you so much, Tina. Um, you know, it's, it's hard as a, a moderator, you're supposed to remain, you know, dispassionate at all times and just move the, the, the discussion along. But it's a little bit hard when you have such a moving speaker with such a moving story to remain completely dispassionate. But turning to the, um, the, the discussion about uh, spreading the word. So, um, you know, this is such an impactful thing, these criminal record clearings. And um, yet we struggle with how do we get the word out there so that more people know and it's not just word of mouth. I actually had a client come in um, relating to a bench warrant fairly recently. And I decided to ask her, how did you come to Volunteer Lawyers for Justice? And she said, well, I had a friend who knew a friend who was in the situation and, and happened to you know hear of this lawyer. And then it just kind of went from there. Um, and I think that that's, we need to be able to broaden that so that it's not just word of mouth for certain people at certain times, but that it's more broadly disseminated. Do you have any uh, kind of thoughts or concepts around that idea, like from the survivor perspective, how would, you know, ways or methods um, to disseminate that information to let them know that this relief is available? Yes. I mean, I, I believe wholeheartedly. I mean, I know that there's a cost behind everything, but I also know that um, it's it would be so well worth the investment. But I believe social media would be a huge a huge way to um, to be able to reach countless countless um, people that are in and out of the life yet. Um, to be able, I know, I know countless survivors now who are still struggling for, for different reasons. And I, I don't want to um, be sharing someone else's and from other people's information, but for different reasons, but it all goes back, Michelle, from being in the life because, you know, it's heartbreaking, but there are people who are supposed to love us whether it be our families, whether it be people that um, we call friends. Um, but these are the same people that betray us. These are the same people you take a chance and say, look, this is what I'm struggling with. This is what happened to me. And those are the same people that turn on you. And they, they reinforce what the, what the criminals did to you you know, calling you worthless, calling you, you deserve this, you, you know, you're nothing but a, you know, POS. And um, so, you know, after a while, when these words continue to play on you from not only those who love you, but from the criminals, you know, you, you start to wear these words and you start to believe it. But when we have these, um, these injections of the reality, whether it be through social media, whether it be through um, what we're doing today, the ECHO model, um, the Volunteers Lawyers for Justice, New Jersey Coalition, TV ads, billboards, radio, it could be so powerful, so impactful for a, a survivor in or out of the life that's struggling there, um, both men and women, and, and they're, they're just in a random place and they hear this go off, <laughs> it's like, you know, hope, you know, wow, you know, they want to hear it again and, and hear it more. I think we need to advertise it more. We need just like we're working with having billboards with um, bringing awareness, like some states are doing really well. And we continue to try hard to get billboards, um, these posters up throughout our state in every place possible where there's uh, people public walking through. I think the same thing needs to be done with this because people don't have a place to turn to. They don't know where they can go because they're still struggling with the layer of believing this is their fault. Who is going to believe me? I am my my best companion. I have two companions here. I have my best companion on this side called fear. And I have my other companion on this side called shame. 
So in between that, I'm wearing all these masks to make sure that I try to fit in to what we're talking about, whether it be regardless of what the setting is. And we're trying to peel through those masks, but if we don't provide um, and do better and take more advanced steps into social media, um, bringing what we're doing today forward, bringing it into the light and letting people hear this across America. And then people aren't gonna have a chance to take this benefit and be able to have a chance at the life that they were given instead of the life that was stolen from them. Um, you know, nobody has a right to rob anybody for humanity. Count, uh, children, countless men and women through labor trafficking and sex trafficking are being robbed of their dignity and their humanity as we speak now. And so, yes, we do need to take advantage of our social media. Whatever and however that social media looks like, we need to plug into. And um, yes, I, I do my part. I can't, there's only one of me. I do my small part um, as best as I could because I could see now, I could hear, and I could, I could see what other survivors go through. And I just want to share with them what was given to me, the gift that was given to me, I could never pay back. I could never pay, pay back. And so I just want others to experience the what I was given to experience, to have that taste of freedom, which I, I can't tell you when I experienced that taste of freedom, but I could tell you that I do experience it now. And it is because of Volunteer Lawyers for Justice. Well, thank you so much. And very well said, very well put. Um, we are at the end of our 90 minutes. Um, so turning to Kate Lee for a moment. Kate, do we have any outstanding questions now? Yes, there is a, a good question. I think it could be shared by uh, both Jessica, well, all Jessica, Gina and Harold. Uh, the question is, are there reentry programs for trafficking victims who have suffered this kind of trauma? Are Harold and Gina anomalies for having so successfully survived? Um, I think Gina and Harold will have a lot more to say about this, but I just wanted to briefly say, um, and I was thinking about this as Gina was, was finishing, I think it's important to recognize, and that's part of why I like this question, understandably, when a survivor is first being identified as a survivor or self-identifies as a survivor and is first accessing services, there's usually emergent issues going on. And criminal record clearing is not going to be anywhere near the top of that list, nor should it be. Under very rare circumstances, is that going to be one of the first things we tackle? But I think the problem with that is that then it can fall by the wayside. And so because the, the first people who are responding and working with survivors, that's not on their list of things to prioritize, we don't then have that next step of what to do. And so I think, um, I don't know that we think of it as formal re-entry programs. Um, I think Harold and Gina are phenomenal. There are other survivors who are definitely thriving. But again, I think it's important that we not paint survivorship as any one thing and, and and I don't think we should decide what success looks like. I think that's for a survivor to to decide um, themselves. But I but I think it's a really important point that we probably do need to have a little bit more infrastructure um, of what that second step looks like for when things aren't an emergency, when there's um, a little bit more settling down to make sure that remembering the other forms of relief that are available hasn't been completely forgotten at that point. Harold um, and Gina, do you want to address the question in terms of the, the, the programs? I just want to add that uh, it is the survivor who has to take the initiative. There are a lot of programs. It's I always say that you can lead the horse to the water, but you cannot make a drink. So I always tell that every survivor, once from victim, he becomes a survivor. Number one, they should go for counseling or they should be recommended to go for counseling. For me, it was a stigma, it was a shame. And I thought I'm mentally sick. I was forced 
or compelled by my ng of uh, by my uh, fbi agent and the service provider to go for counseling and i just want to give an example <clears throat> after 6 months as to always tell the counselor who was a young lady like jessica and as to always say i'm illegal i'm illegal but one word in one second changed my life she told me harold why are you always saying for the last 6 months that you are illegal he told me harold you are undocumented and when she said that i was totally changed i was a changed person and then i realized i'm not a criminal i not go to prison <clears throat> i not done any crime number 2 after one year i told us beat up myself like ian gina said you know it's a stigma it's a shame she told me the counselor that harold you got to accept your mistake it happened that's fine that's okay i always tell that what did i do like i felt i was a sinner so there are certain small things that will transform you that is one is counseling number two is medical treatment every victim or survivor gets four things complimentary when they are a victim of human trafficking that's vision dental blood pressure and diabetes so you got to check them and counseling is a continuous process it's not there's just one time i just want to add to all my audience that the challenges being faced in labor trafficking and where i'm working with my eyes open international is to start a male shelter home there are a lot of shelter homes for for ladies or females but in in labor trafficking 90% of the victims are foreign nationals and for them to get justice they need safety security and stability so to start a male shelter home and there should be no barriers that if you don't have documentation if you need documentation even if you do not do not have any documentation but they should be allowed to stay in a male shelter home number one number 2 i know jessica is here you are here michelle is that i am working for expungement in the case of labor trafficking there is expungement in the case of sex trafficking and that is the reason many victims are not coming out and sharing like uh, jessica said once you open there will be a flood gate you know, people will be just coming but we need that and lastly there are resources like continued presence the u visa the t visa the permanent residency card and the us citizenship like many people are not many people have the u visa but the wait period for the u, u visa is more than 10 years because there are more than 100000 applicants i have been advocating during barack obama's time the president and during president donald trump that we need to increase the cap from 10000 to either 25000 but it's a huge challenge but what is the solution number 1 increase the cap number 2 give them work permit how are this victims going to survive so there are a lot of challenges we have to face a lot of improvement has been done a lot of progress has been done i would like to thank uh, new jersey coalition against human trafficking like what gina said and what kate has done and here is a live example a brown skin guy being supported inspired by all of you thank you <laughs> Gina, I do just want to clarify that we definitely have states a lot of states at this point that do offer vacature for for labor trafficking survivors as well. Um I it usually was not a specific it only applies to sex trafficking survivors it was crafted in the type of offenses um but but we I'm I'm pleased to say that we're in much better shape now in terms of states offering relief um vacature relief not just expungement to both sex and labor trafficking survivors. Thank, Thank you. you. Um Gina, uh, can you weigh in? Um you, you know, I have to pick you back off of what uh Harold said. Uh for me the one and foremost um critical part of this even what Jessica said, it's not going with the um you know, when we talk about vacation and expungement, for me the very first part was still going through the counseling. and it's not going to counseling a few times and say i'm all better i mean i still continue on that healing process because it's important um there's things that come up that you know you're traumatized you deal with that trauma for your whole life uh but you learn how to manage it you learn how to cope and put things in the proper perspective because you do get activated you do get these triggers from time to time and you don't want to be like you know hurt people hurt people you know um you want to be able to just be sensible and use good discernment as to where where is this coming from why is this happening why am i feeling this way 
um, when to say no. And it doesn't mean when people go through uh, counseling, when survivors go through counseling, it doesn't mean that we're all called to do this work. Um, we're not all called to do this work. Um, we choose to do this work. Uh, we don't have to. It doesn't mean to thrive and to have a full life that that means you need to get up and speak and share your lived experience. No survivor um, should have to share their lived experience. No one should be asked to share their lived experience. Um, it should be something that you're comfortable doing. This is not about a movie. It's not about uh, sensational being sensationalized with what you went through. Uh, there's a way to teach. There's a way to share without getting into uh, details, which is something that I learned along my journey as well from some really good, strong mentors. Um, but to be able to bring awareness, I don't think that there's one school that I go to teach at um, as recently as probably a couple months ago, um, but there's not, every time I speak at a school, whether it be middle school or high school, there's always a line of kids ready to want to talk to me. And it's not about, you know, positive things. They are looking for a safe place. They are looking to speak because they're struggling with things and they could relate to some things as far as the red flags and things that we all need to be aware of, we all need to watch for. It doesn't matter, as I say all the time, human trafficking, labor trafficking and sex trafficking discriminate against no one. And it comes in many forms and many ages. And so um, when we talk about, you know, what does a full life look like? To me, I thrive when I'm able to refer someone to volunteer for Lawyers for Justice and someone's holding their kids back because I'm gonna hold your kid back for you because this is what you did in your past and you don't deserve to have your kid. Who is that? Who is that? You're no better than the, you're no better than the criminal who did this to you. And these are, like I said earlier, I'm sorry for repeating myself, but these are people that are supposed to love and protect you and encourage you and lift you. And they're punishing you by keeping your kid from you, keeping you from thriving, from having a full life. So I'm excited to see, to see this uh, flourish, to, to see this grow, to see that uh, people that are being violated every day, both uh, boys, girls, men and women, that they know that they have a safe place to go to. Um, not just to clear their record. One of the things that Jessica um, Jessica showed me that was just so impactful on me is that she just sat there and listened to me first. I mean, I was sitting there analyzing her like, why does she care? Why is she doing this? And she didn't have to say anything. Her, her actions spoke in volumes along with other people that she worked with that she works with. And that has been something that has been evident across the board. So I can never shout out. It's just something that I, <laughs> that I add in to what I talk about when I go to different events and that I could feel free and talk about what people, not only what people, the people that violated me aren't even as important to give them that platform as the people who have helped to lift me and bring me to a place of healing and healthy, a healthy place where I'm at today, like all of you. So yeah, thank you. Wonderful way to end the program. I don't believe there are any other outstanding q and is, is that correct, Kate? Yes, that's correct. Although one just popped in um, and I'm just gonna read it out. Um, uh, so it's it's just a it's really more of a congratulations. Um, hello, I'm an Italian law student in France. I was very impressed by Jessica's lecture and PowerPoint. I came from the south of Italy, so I'm very interested in human trafficking, as it's some, something that happens a lot in Sicily, my home island. Would it be possible to share the PowerPoint with me? Um, I can certainly tell everybody that this is being recorded, and uh, the recording link will be shared with everybody that is listening here today. Um, Jessica, is it? Would you want to share your PowerPoint as well? Is that something that you'd like to do? 
You're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry. So close to getting through the whole thing without doing that. I, um, I, I, I'm responding in the Q&A with my email address for that individual. Um, I don't know if there's a way I can, is it okay for me to briefly share my screen? I have a PowerPoint slide that has, nope, I don't, I closed it. Um, my email address, I'll just say it, is J K I T as in Tom, S as in Sam, O, N as in Nancy, J Kitson, so first initial, then full last name, at V L J N J, Volunteer Lawyers Justice, New Jersey, V L J N J dot org. Um, and has just put that into the into the everybody's um, right in front of everybody. So that's great. Thank you for doing that. Great, wonderful. Well, I want to take a moment to thank everyone for attending today, and to thank every single one of our panelists. What a wonderful and impactful presentation! Um, I'm sure there's more to come on all of this. Have a wonderful day, and take care. Thank you. Thank you.